<laughs> Alright, in this episode, we're going to talk about plate tectonics. So if you're curious and want to learn more about it, watch all the way to the end and hopefully this video will be useful for you. For the chapter of plate tectonics, you will realize that the overarching question is living with tectonic hazards, risk or opportunity. So we are going to unpack this chapter and behind me, I have the entire mind map um, and um, I noticed that it's cut off at the top as well as uh, behind me. But the thing is, even though this mind map looks extensive, it is actually not. I actually omitted the part from Gateway 1 talking about the formation of all the different landforms uh, that are at different plate boundaries. So I'm going to make another video for this so I'll probably put the link up here as well as down below in the description box. Without further ado let's talk about the first tectonic hazard and that is earthquake. So now for earthquakes itself basically we've got to recognize that they are found in every single plate boundary. We have conversion plate boundary, diversion plate boundary as well as transform plate boundary. So why are they found at all plate boundaries? You've got to first recognize that it is because the movement and interaction of plates can result in the formation of earthquakes. So let's just go through a very brief overview of how earthquakes are formed. So now when you have two plates interacting with one another, be it that they are moving towards each other or moving away from each other or sliding past each other, basically stress is being built up. So it comes to a point where the rocks can no longer withstand this stress and they will suddenly slip. Now when they suddenly slip, this slip itself will actually release energy in a form of seismic waves. So the seismic waves will radiate out from the focus, which is the origin of the earthquake, out in all directions towards the earth's surface. Now can you imagine, directly above the focus would be the epicenter. All right, so the nearer it is to the epicenter, the stronger the shake. Because these seismic waves, as they radiate out towards the earth's surface, we actually feel it as earthquakes, vibrations on the ground. All right, so that's why the further it is away from the epicenter, the less violent the shake, and therefore we would always associate with less destruction. All right, so if we look back at the mind map itself, you'll realize that under earthquake, um, I actually associate the movement and interaction of plates to the convection current within the mantle. So let's just go through this thought process so that everything will make sense. Now basically in order for plates to move, we first need to look at the convection current that's happening within the mantle. So why is there convection current in the first place? So now look back at gateway one, you will realize that for the internal structure of the earth, we have the core, the mantle as well as the crust. So we do recognize that the core itself is basically the hottest part of the entire earth. Um, basically can reach up to 5,000 degrees Celsius and temperatures generally decrease as it moves up towards the crust. Alright, so now we just got to visualize the core being the hottest part of the earth as the heat source and basically the mantle itself we understand is in a semi-molten state. So as the core heats up the mantle material, this mantle material will now expand and it rises and it spreads out beneath the plates on the crust and basically this movement actually causes the diversion of the plates. As this process continues, it spreads out beneath the plates and it cools and it sinks. So imagine this as one convection current cell. So we have two convection current cells. So if two convection current cells are actually um, circulating at the same time, the downward movement of both cells will actually result in the plates to converge. All right, so because of this convergence, it will result in a conversion plate boundary. So basically, if it's two continental plates, right, the edges of the plates will buckle and fold upwards or sideways to form fold mountains. And if it is actually an oceanic plate that's involved in this process, the oceanic plate itself is denser and therefore it will subduct. So this process of subduction will actually result in the formation of oceanic trench as well as volcanoes. 
So now that you have a brief idea of what's happening, um, next thing that I want to address would be transform plate boundary. So just a quick overview because I noticed that students can't seem to understand how convection current can lead to transform plate boundaries. Now first we're going to recognize that the image that's shown in your textbook basically this one is actually a 2D image but in reality if we understand plates itself they are not just circular or squarish um, blocks of crust but instead they are all different in size as well as in shape and therefore um, we have to recognize that with convection current certain parts of the plates will actually slide past each other this motion itself will result in the formation of transform plates boundary and basically the landform that's created will be the transform fault so now let's just go back to earthquakes all right now um, if we look at the explanation for earthquakes basically what is it is the sudden release of stored energy in the rocks that are found along the fault lines and what can it lead to basically all this uh, summary of what's in your textbook they're quite straightforward but what I would like to address would be the explanation because it's common for students to say oh earthquakes will lead to the loss of lives but we first need to understand that the vibration and the violent shakes of the earth's surface will not cause people to die but what will actually lead to all this um, high death toll is basically due to the collapse of infrastructure which can then injure as well as kill um, the individuals who are actually within the vicinity so common misconception students just simply say earthquakes will lead to death but how all right so that's something to take note of and that's why you will notice that um, developed countries invest so much money in ensuring that infrastructures can withstand the violent shakes because since deaths are usually associated with the destruction of infrastructure that's something for us to take note of all right next would be yeah basically the destruction of infrastructure this will actually affect accessibility especially if we are talking about infrastructures such as um, the roads as well as the bridges and this will heavily hamper the search and rescue operations that will take place immediately after an earthquake and next would be destruction of properties now this itself what is the impact the impact would be the displacement of people from their homes so if people are displaced from their homes basically that's a social impact but if you want to link it to an economic impact then you got to talk about the restoration of um, the houses and the reconstruction of their houses and uh, next we have disruption of services basically usually linked to telecommunication services um, or you can talk about um, the water supply because um, earthquake if it's a very high magnitude earthquake it can lead to the breakage of um, the water pipes and next would be landslide now notice that I've written over here that it's terrain dependent because landslide yes it's an impact but it's not applicable to um, countries that do not have mountainous terrains so landslide basically affects the communities that are located at the base of the mountains or the hills so um, it's usually associated to unconsolidated soil um, and yeah when you want to choose this point please be mindful of the location of where you are actually explaining basically one good example would be the Sichuan earthquake that occurred in China in 2008 let me check the magnitude and um, Sichuan and it is 8.0 so basically this Sichuan earthquake it occurred in a mountainous region and the high death toll is caused by number one the destruction of the infrastructures and number two would be that the people are also buried under um, the sediments from the landslide itself all right so now let's focus on the extent of destruction caused by earthquakes um, now it's easy to assume that the higher the magnitude the greater the destruction that means the higher the death as well as the higher the economic cost but that's not always the case even though it's most likely the case but it's not always the case because we have to consider other factors such as um, I've listed down a series of different factors but suddenly it came to my mind that I've missed out one which is the depth of focus if you have a deep focus earthquake which is more than 70 kilometers down um, from the earth's surface um, then basically you'll notice that the impacts is not not 
as severe as it could be uh, because the greater the distance, the seismic waves will have to travel a longer distance and during this time it loses energy before it reaches the Earth's surface. So apart from magnitude as well as depth of focus of the earthquake, of course we have a series of different other factors to consider. Things like population density, the level of preparedness which would determine whether or not the death toll will be high and I'll talk more about this when we reach the later part. It's actually from Gateway 3. And then we have time of occurrence, of course if it happened in the afternoon versus if it happened in the middle of the night where people are mostly asleep and they are not able to evacuate efficiently. Um, and then we have the type of soil which can also lead to um, secondary impacts such as liquefaction and you can look back at the 2011 Christchurch earthquake. And of course the last one would be um, responses. Now we're talking about short-term and long-term responses. And now in this case if there is effective short-term response such as um, the deployment of um, search and rescue teams um, to get to the site immediately after the occurrence of the earthquake and provide them with the necessary help and resource then in this case the death toll can actually be greatly reduced. So let's focus on the level of preparedness. Basically we're looking at all the different preparedness measures. Um, if we look at the first one, land use regulation. So if a government set aside a particular plot of land that is near a fault line that is at risk and um, they decide to relocate the people and, and set aside this land for other recreational purpose to reduce high death toll um, during the occurrence of earthquake. Now you require the cooperation of the local communities so that's one and usually the communities within the developed countries are more cooperative in this case. So next we have infrastructure design which is also more effective in developed nations because they have the resources such as financial capacity as well as the technology. And then we have emergency drills and a good example to look at would be Japan. Um, every 1st of September, they have the um, National Prevention, Disaster Prevention Day. So you can have a look at what the country does to prepare the citizens. And of course, the last one would be the use of technology to monitor as well as to warn the citizens of oncoming earthquake as well as um, tsunamis. Now, in this case, got to take note of the fact that um, even though if you have very well um, established monitoring and warning system, if it occurred in the middle of the night, the death toll will still be high. So we've got to consider all those different factors to explain and justify why death toll can be high or low in certain case studies. Okay. All right. So next, we're gonna talk about volcanic eruptions as the next tectonic has it. Now, for volcanic eruptions itself, first you gotta recognize how are volcanoes form in the first place. Now they are found at diversion or continue uh, diversion or conversion plate boundaries. So um, now, if we are explaining about diversion plate boundaries, um, let's say if it's CC diversions, you have continental continental diversions. First of all, you'll get rift valleys as well as block mountains. So um, because of the nature of how um, uh, the rift valleys formed, there's a lot of tensional force, there's a lot of cracks as well as fault lines that are created. So the magma can actually exploit all those lines of weaknesses and that's why you get to notice that volcanoes are dotted along uh, the rift valley. And then the next one would be oceanic oceanic divergence. So during this process itself, you will notice that um, apart from the formation of the mid oceanic ridge, you also notice volcanoes dotted along it. Same explanation, the magma exploits the lines of weaknesses. But in this case, for OO divergence, it is basically the formation of submarine volcanoes, and over time, they can actually form volcanic islands. So please make sure you specify them. And next, we have volcanoes formed at conversion plate boundaries. Now in order for volcanoes to form, first of all you need to recognize that subduction must occur. So for subduction to occur, you need to have oceanic oceanic conversions or oceanic continental conversions. So there must be an oceanic plate that's involved in this process. Because the oceanic plate is denser, it was subduct and during the process of subduction, part of the oceanic plate will actually melt to form magma and this magma will exploit the lines of weaknesses and basically it will form volcano on the overlying plate. So that's why if you have 
OC convergence, the volcano will be formed on the overlying plate, which is the continental plate, and that's why it's a volcano. But if you have OO convergence, then in this case, um, the volcanoes will be formed on the overlying plate, which is the less dense or the slower moving oceanic plate. And in this case, you will get submarine volcano or volcanic island. Okay, basically if we talk about volcanic eruptions, the explanation is pretty straightforward. Um, it is the release of pressure in the magma chamber and it will release volcanic materials such as volcanic ash, lava, uh, volcanic gases, as well as volcanic bombs. Alright, so all this release of volcanic materials will lead to a localized impact. What kind of impact? Basically, loss of lives from the threat of the volcanic materials that are very high in temperature. And then, of course, destruction of homes, um, destruction of properties, infrastructure, which will affect um, accessibility. So it's pretty much similar to that of the, uh, the part that we've talked about under earthquake. So I won't go into detail about this, but... I'm going to focus more on the extent of destruction and basically it varies according to two main points. Number one would be the amount of pressure and then number two would be the type of volcanoes. So let me explain this in greater detail. So first of all, let's focus on the type of volcanoes. Now we have two main types of volcanoes um, that's in this syllabus. Of course, there are more, but the two main types, which is basically the two most popular types of volcanoes that you can find on Earth itself is stratovolcanoes as well as shield volcanoes. So for stratovolcanoes, they're usually found at conversion plate boundaries. So why is that the case? It's got to do with your understanding of the subduction process. So during subduction, because of the melting of part of the um, subducted plate as well as the mantle material, this actually releases greater amounts of silica content into the lava. And since the lava has high silica content, the lava is now more viscous, which means it's less runny, it's less flowy. And because of this, you result in a steep gradient of the um, and because of this it results in a steep gradient profile of the volcano right because just imagine if the volcano erupts and then the lava being more viscous it flows down slowly on the sides of the volcano and before it can even reach the base it's already cooled and solidified so it basically just piles up every single time the volcano erupts and because of this it will lead to a very steep gradient and now back to the lava itself since it's less viscous it also traps gas easily so if it traps gas easily we can understand that um, during a volcanic eruption it will be very explosive it can lead to other secondary impacts such as pyroclastic flow and um, of course we have other things like I think I've written them down over here landslide air pollution as well as the effects on the weather which is basically temporary uh, global deeming um, now this has got to do with weather and climate as the volcano erupts um, one of the gas which is sulfur dioxide it reacts with the water vapor in the atmosphere um, it results in the formation of sulfate aerosols which basically reflects the solar energy back into space and therefore it results in the temporary uh, decrease in the earth's temperature so one good example you can talk about would be Mount Pinatubo which erupted and it resulted in the global temperatures decrease of 0.2 or 0.4 degrees Celsius can check it out in your textbook all right and um, yeah because of this um, that's why it can lead to temporary alteration of the herbs weather system next we have shield volcanoes so as for shield volcanoes it's basically a direct opposite of stratovolcanoes um, they're usually found at diversion plate boundaries the silica content is lower than that of stratovolcanoes because there's no subduction involved basically the magma from the magma chamber rises through the cracks and fissures to the earth's surface and that's why the magma itself or the lava itself now um, on the earth's surface it contains less silica content and that's why it's less viscous and because it's more runny in this case 
if there is a volcanic eruption, most of the lava will flow very quickly to the base before it cools and solidifies. And that's why for shield volcano, you notice that the profile of it is that it's gentler in the gradient and it has a wider base. Alright, and because of that, you also notice that the viscosity, since it's more runny, it cannot trap gas easily and that's why during a volcanic eruption, it is less explosive. But, here's one interesting thing. Like I mentioned that it is found at diversion plate boundaries, right? So, shield volcanoes are usually found at rift valleys as well as at um, the mid-oceanic reach. And one good example would be Iceland, right? Iceland is a volcanic island that's formed at the diversion plate boundary itself. But if you recall the famous Icelandic volcanic eruption of the volcano that I can't pronounce for nuts, <laughs> but um, if you remember the example, you'll notice that the, the eruption itself is very explosive. Now the reason is because you have to look at how frequent the volcano erupts. So if you understand that a volcano which is dormant, it doesn't erupt that frequently, there's a lot of pressure being built up. So it doesn't matter whether it's a shield volcano or a strato volcano, the eruption itself will be explosive just because the accumulated pressure is now suddenly released. So for the Icelandic volcanic eruption, if you go and read up about it, you'll realize that it affected the aviation industry, it affected the health of individuals and um, it's all because of the amount of volcanic ash that's released um, and the explosive nature of the eruption of this shield volcano. Alright, so lastly, we're going to talk about tsunamis as the third tectonic hazard. And uh, for tsunamis itself, nothing difficult. Basically, there are three different causes. Number one being high magnitude, notice the keyword, high magnitude underwater earthquake. And then number two would be um, large scale underwater volcanic eruptions. Or number three would be landslides. Landslides that occur at the edge of, um, at a coastal area. So what do you notice? Notice in common for all these three causes basically they must release a lot of energy and it will result in the sudden displacement of large mass of water bodies so for instance if we're looking at a high magnitude underwater earthquake all right um, can you imagine if the plates suddenly slip a couple of meters basically the column of water that is directly above the plates will now be displaced so just like how you have a calm bucket of water and you just drop something in the middle the water gets displaced right and what do you notice ripples right so if you think about this in a larger scale of course um, the displacement of water will set out a series of waves in all directions and because of the nature of waves the moment you reach um, shallow waters there's greater amounts of friction the wave height will increase and yeah this will actually result in the formation of tsunami waves and, and since we mentioned that the waves travel in all directions so basically this can affect multiple countries that are along the coastal area so one good example that is from a textbook is actually the Indian Ocean tsunami that occurred in 2004 and this is a very nice map that shows you um, the countries that affected a total of 12 countries and um, yeah if you look at the map carefully you will notice that there are numbers um, drawn on the lines so basically the lines are referring to the waves and the numbers are basically referring to the number of hours um, that it takes for the waves to travel so for the countries that are further away from the focus of the earthquake it actually takes a couple of hours for the tsunami waves to um, arrive and therefore they have more time to evacuate and then for the countries that are nearer of course there's lesser time for them to evacuate because the waves actually reach them at a faster rate okay Alright, so now back to the overarching question. I know my face is huge right now, but anyway, if you look at the overarching question, living with tectonic hazards, risk or opportunity, um, I guess the most straightforward answer would be that there's definitely more risk that's involved, but uh, we got to understand that there can be opportunities as well, particularly for areas that are vulnerable to volcanic eruptions because of what um, active volcanoes 
volcanoes can actually bring to um, the communities they're living within the vicinity. So common mistake that I notice students tend to write in their answer would be, let's say if a question is asking you, explain the economic benefits of living near volcanic areas, then most of the students will start off their answer with one economic benefit is fertile soil. Now, <laughs> fertile soil is not an economic benefit. What can you make out of this fertile soil that can bring about benefits to the community? Then that's the economic benefit. So in this case, you can explain that one economic benefit would be for agricultural farmers to gain a profit from the sales of increased amount of agricultural crops due to the availability of fertile soil. That is an economic benefit. If not, you can explain that um, agricultural farmers now need not invest so much in fertilizers and because of this, they can earn more through the sales of agricultural crops. And it depends on how you want to link. But the key idea is that fertile soil itself is not an economic benefit. So the next point would be the availability of precious stones and minerals. Now this point itself, you can link it to economic benefits like um, job opportunities available for individuals within the mining or within the jewelry industry and this will increase their income and things like that. Um, but good to take note of the fact that it takes thousands of years for the rocks to weather down to expose all these precious stones and minerals. So got to choose your case studies wisely. Okay, and of course we have tourism sector, so um, uh, you can talk about how uh, living near volcanic areas can bring about job opportunities. Living near volcanic areas can actually bring about job opportunities for the locals, especially within the tourism sector. They can be employed directly or indirectly, and we've talked about this in the chapter of tourism. So um, indirect employment would be things like working as drivers or within the F and B industry um, that can serve both the locals as well as the tourists um, but they do benefit with increased tourist uh, arrival and yeah the last one would be geothermal energy now this straightforward but same thing um, don't mention that one economic benefit is geothermal energy uh, but what about geothermal energy it allows individuals or the locals to um, save cost from the electrical bills things like that so make sure that you're able to draw the link to what the question is asking for Okay, so before I sum it up, good to first understand that yes, all these are the different benefits, but do you notice that um, people still carry on staying in um, areas that are vulnerable to volcanic eruptions? For instance, if I'm an agricultural farmer living in Indonesia and I'm living in a volcanic region such as at the base of Mount Merapi, right so in this case for me i would rather stay on because the economic benefits outweigh the risk and why is this the case even though i know that volcanic eruptions can cause severe destruction but the frequency of occurrence of volcanic eruptions are not as high and therefore i will continue to um, reap daily economic benefits from um, the fertile soil and that's why in this case i would rather choose to stay on um, in the area that's vulnerable to volcanic eruptions. So in this case, do you notice that um, the concept that I'm using is actually frequency of occurrence, right? Especially for volcanic eruptions, in this case, they don't occur on a monthly or annual basis. So it's good to bring up this point um, and you weigh it with the economic benefits that they can gain. Okay, so I hope this video has been useful in helping you understand the chapter of plate tectonics and help you unpack the chapter and aid in your revision. So um, let me know if you have any questions down below or DM me your questions on Instagram and I'm more than happy to help and I'll make another video on Gateway 1 about the different tectonic um, landforms probably tomorrow or the day after. And yeah, so I hope all of you will have a good time revising and understanding about plate tectonics and we'll see each other again. Bye!